Thanks, Luke, and thanks, everyone. Uh, so I'm Sky. I'm uh, from Microsoft Research. Um, so today I'm going to talk about semantic parsing for question answering. And it's really just a high-level summary of uh, several papers we did uh, from 2000. I think the first one I did was from 2014, but the one I'm going to talk about is uh, 15 uh, and actually this year. Um, and uh, as always, uh, you know, I cannot do the whole uh, work myself, uh, so uh, I should also use this chance to thank a lot of uh, my collaborators. Um, most of them are uh, my colleagues at MSR, and then uh, the last one is uh, Mohia Yue, uh, who was our intern last summer, and uh, I think he will join here in a couple months. Okay. So uh, the topic, uh, the, the, the vacation I uh, want to do here is really um, talking about like. Uh, answer questions using structured data. So in this very broad setting, the information source is some kind of database, but it's in a loosely defined term. So a database could be um, just a set of tables, uh, or could be uh, a collection of records, or it, be, it could be actually a well-designed uh, large-scale database with complex schema. Okay. And the input is just a natural language question uh, instead of a formal query, for example, like SQL or whatever. Uh, and then I just want to output the answer. Okay. So just to give you a, sh a few animation type of things, uh, like the, the user will ask like, which AO team won the most games in the season? And the computer system check with some database and then come up with the answer, 2001 Seattle Mariners. Um, yeah, okay. So um, for this problem, I mean, of course, you can directly look at the data and try to get an answer. And, uh, the mainstream approach for this is, at least in the NLP dom domain, is called semantic parsing of questions. Okay. So the idea is that basically the system tries to translate the question to some kind of uh, formal query that the database system can understand. Uh, for example, if you're using a kind of relational da a database, you may directly translate your question to some kind of SQL query because that, that's kind of the standard language used uh, in this structure database. Okay. Okay. So um, this problem is particularly interesting, uh, partially because of several um, intertwined like, technical challenges. So I kind of categorize those challenges into four buckets. Uh, the first one is uh, what I call semantic matching problem. Um, it has at least two different um, interpretations. One is that even just looking at the questions itself, and you can, you know, humans are very creative, you can actually create uh, different kinds of variations of the same question, essentially asking about the same thing. Uh, another thing is that eventually you want to translate, to map this natural language thing to um, some kind of structured query, so uh, you have to talk in a language that the database uses. So in that case, that means that, you know, if you are actually dealing with some kind of formal knowledge base, then you want to, and you need to, actually figure out, okay, this entity mentioned probably maps to this uh, canonical entity ID, uh, or some kind of relation actually maps to the predicate defined in the uh, knowledge base. So there's a certain matching issue. The second part is the um, large search space. Um, so again, it could mean at least two different things. One is that uh, maybe the database you use is actually very large, so uh, you want to traverse the entities and relationship uh, among different kind of entities, and sometimes there could be some heavy nodes that connects to a lot of uh, entities. And in that case, you definitely will have a search problem. Uh, another <coughs> interpretation is that even on the semantic parse part, because um, especially if you want to construct a very long, uh, complicated semantic parse uh, by adding some uh, pr primitive statements. And because you can, uh, the choice you can add is getting more and more, so in the end, it, it uh, the potential process actually grows uh, exponentially. Okay, the third challenge is that uh, even nowadays, I think uh, we still have limited label data for training semantic parsers. Um, first of all, it's usually hard um, to have a fully labeled semantic parse. So, um, you know, to write the formal queries um, and then so. Uh, using the machine translation paradigm to create this kind of pair corpus is actually not that trivial. And so most people actually try the weekly supervision setting in the sense that uh, maybe just get pairs of questions and answers and then um, 
try to use that to infer the, the parse. So this is less optimal, but it's uh, probably the most practical approach nowadays. And because of that, you actually introduce new learning challenges because you, you can't just t take the traditional uh, you know, you know, well-studied uh, supervised learning setting. Instead, you may want to uh, create some fancy terms like learning from distance supervision, indirect supervision, or a mixed supervision, uh, uh, this kind of learning framework. And finally, uh, compositionality is one of the terms that uh, academics talk about and love. Uh, essentially, it means that you know, uh, language composition means that um, the meaning of the complicated uh, expression is uh, determined by the meanings of its constituent um, expressions and there's also some kind of rules to combine them. Uh, you know, for example, you probably can parse this question even though it's long and complicated. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more on this issue later. OK, so um, here's a plan for my talk today. Um, so I'm going to cover essentially these three papers, but uh, I'll probably just talk very little about the, the middle one. Um, so the first paper is uh, semantic parsing the staged uh, query graph generation. And we build a system we call stack. Um, and the second part is uh, essentially we improve the data set use um, in the first work. Um, so the first two papers are about using um, large base, in this case, particular, uh, in particular, uh, free base to answer natural language question. And the, the last one is our latest work, uh, which is going to be in ACL 2017. So this is, uh, we use tables as our information source to answer questions. In this case, in particular, we target uh, multi-turn question answering. So we will have, a, uh, a, we'll have sequences of uh, questions. OK. Um, so this is uh, our 2015 paper, uh, which got almost best paper award. <laughs> uh, OK, so the, the topic here is using, uh, to use nudge base to answer questions. So this is actually not a new topic. Um, uh, and so the first kind of famous one well, it's actually probably not the first, but one of the famous, famous systems uh, uh, created 40 years ago was actually, um, you know, the database is really just some records about uh, the moon rocks. And then at the time, they were trying to use, uh, uh, trying to create a system to answer questions about um, the moon rock sample um, retrieved uh, from different, um, you know, uh, uh, from a power program. And then, um, and then another famous system is uh, GeoQuery, which uh, was created um, 20 years ago by Ray Mooney and uh, his student. Um, so in, in this case, they basically have some facts about uh, US uh, geography and about 800 facts in the database. Um, and then they store, it, they, I think they re <coughs> store these uh, facts using the, um, their predefined uh, logic a predicate and um, entity and, and so on. So the goal is actually to use that to answer questions like uh, what's the capital of the state with the largest population and so on. Okay. So um, the early work uh, shared some similar uh, um, characteristics. For example, they are usually small scale and then domain specific knowledge bases, uh, which means that the schema is kind of simple. So and there's uh, relatively small numbers of entities and relations. Um, so these kind of things actually limited possible questions you can ask. Um, and in terms of approach, usually the methods are kind of ad hoc or manually um, created rules, uh, but they are quite effective because of this restricted domain. Um, um, and the approach there is also the semantic parsing part of the question. So they'll try to map the question to some kind of uh, logical representation that they can run against the database. So the common issues that people criticize uh, will be the first one because it's kind of small scale, so it's not clear whether the methods can really uh, be scalable. The second is that uh, since they are very domain specific, so they probably cannot be used to support more open domain questions, and so like you know the different kind of factory questions you may uh, want to ask when using a search engine. Um, but the existence, uh, the appearance of the uh, large-scale knowledge base kind of changed this uh, picture. Um, because nowadays, we have uh, quite a few uh, what we call the large-scale knowledge base. Uh, you may have 
uh, hundreds of millions or even billions of entities, and then uh, there are some relationship uh, in the uh, among the entities. Um, so it's both from academia and also from uh, industry. So uh, this seems to be a good use um, to answer open domain questions. Um, for example, here, if you look at uh, the subgraph of this uh, knowledge base about Barack Obama, then uh, you can use that to answer questions about his family re relationship. OK, so uh, in this work, uh, we uh, essentially propose um, <coughs> two different ideas um, you know, compared to our previous work. The first one is that uh, even though we still want to do semantic parsing, uh, we, don't, we don't end to directly generate this kind of logical form or Sparkle query. Uh, instead, we invented a, a, the different representation we, which we call the query graph. Uh, so in vain is a kind of overused term. Really, we are trying to represent um, the logical form in this kind of graph representation. The reason is that first, uh, we are using FreeBase, which is a, a knowledge graph, a knowledge database, to uh, answer questions. So representing it as graph, you can actually, um, it's easier to map that to the subgraph in the knowledge base. Uh, so that's the reason we choose that as query, uh, as our representation. And then uh, also, it, the mapping is actually straightforward. So once we actually represent that in the uh, graph query, it can be um, directly mapped to some kind of formal query, like a lambda calculus. And uh, by doing that, then we also make a reduction. So uh, now the semantic parsing problem is, in our work, we frame it as a state action search problem. Essentially, we start from zero, and we try to grow this query graph um, uh, through what we call the stitch. Uh, state actions. So these are the high-level ideas. So let me dive in a little bit to explain what I meant. So here is one example of uh, the query graph we meant. Um, so you can say that the first line here is the uh, input question we want to translate to want to map. And uh, this is the equivalent logical form uh, without the first part. Uh, so, uh, so it basically is who voice make on family guy. OK, so and then the bottom part is our query graph that actually represents the original question. Okay. And it has um, three main parts. The first one is what we call the topic entity. So it's really one of the entities that you see uh, in the question. And then the second part is what we call the co-inferential chain. But it basically means that uh, the, relation, the main relationship between your topic entity and also the answer. So in this case, it means that, OK, we want to find the actor of a family guy. But the question uh, doesn't ask all the actors. It actually asks for um, a particular actor who plays the role of make. So of course, the third part is that you have to ask more constraints uh, to uh, <coughs> say that, OK, these answers uh, have, has to satisfy those constraints to be the correct answer. OK. So, um, and the generation part is uh, what we call the stage is that we basically um, categorize part of um, actions um, by different stages. So the first one is that if we start from nothing, and the first stage is really trying to uh, find the topic entity. So this is our first stage. And as you can see, that if you uh, look at the original question, <coughs> at least you can find two different entities. One's make, uh, the other is family guy. Um, so since we actually formulate it as a search problem, we don't commit to any of them uh, immediately. Instead, we actually maintain uh, big, some bin size and then try to explore as many as possible. Um, so in this case, the, from the original state, and then the next state would be, OK, let's explore uh, each entities. So in this case, we'll explore Family Guy and also make Griffin. And then the second uh, step is actually to identify the main relation between the uh, topic entity and also the answer. Um, but here, we already can actually use knowledge base to sh reduce our search space. So instead of actually looking at all possible uh, predicates, relationship types defined in a knowledge base, instead we can actually use the topic entity as the anchor. And then we just look at the graph and then look at oh, the pos uh, possible path and in its neighbors, and then to get um, some candidate relations in this case. Uh, so in this particular example, we can explore like 
S3, S4, S5, these are three different states, um, and they connect the topic entity and answer using different uh, relationships. And finally, uh, if we have decided, okay, one of the uh, relation, uh, one of the main relation, the inferential chain, then we can consider adding uh, more constraints, basically trying to say, okay, this answer has to satisfy some property like whether the character is McRiven and uh, uh, whether she is really the first actor, uh, sorry, actress or not. Okay, so um, essentially you can see that we basically divide this task into several stages and then so each stage we can actually conquer one by one. So the first one is the topic entity linked. Um, so in this case, we actually just use our, my colleague's work. So this is, uh, this paper is from Minwei Chen and also his intern. Uh, essentially we have an in-house uh, entity linking system for doing this. Um, and um, so I just skip the detail, but essentially the system already, um, how it works is that it, they first collect a lot of evidence like, oh, we have, for this entity, we have seen these mentions in different corpus. So uh, they pre-build a large table. And then uh, if you actually see this mention, uh, this phrase in the short text, then immediately it actually becomes a multicast classification. Um, so that's basically how it does work. Um, and of course, because we want to explore uh, as many poss possibilities as possible, so instead of actually using the top one prediction from the entity linking system and trust it, uh, we'll use the uh, top rank entities and then try to explore more op um, options. Okay. Are you assuming that in there is half some main density? Half some main density? Are you assuming every query yeah. includes some main density? Um, Oh, that one. Uh, I see. So yeah, we we got this question quite often. So we um, we haven't done that particularly because the data that we use in this task doesn't really have a lot of questions like that. Um, but similar question would be like um, like what's the highest mountain? So in that case, you don't really have a name entity there. Um, um, that kind of things will probably have to. Um, Designs slightly spatially for that. Yeah. Yes. There are generalizations of linking to the concept from this idea that aren't named entities. There are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you can do that. For example, even mountain is an entity in uh, a large base. Um, uh, but the reason why I hesitate to actually just jump to that is that because it's too common. So uh, usually the node is actually very dense in a large base. For example, yes, you can probably link mountain, but then do you have to actually check all the mountains? And then so, so yeah, so, uh, so you both are right. Um, but I believe that we, we haven't tested seriously on these kind of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's assume that there's still kind of nice topic entity in the question. Uh, and then the second part is really just to identify, okay, now which uh, main relation uh, are you talking about? that is between the topic entity and also the answer. So I put a link from Family Guide to who basically just means that who you can think of that that's uh, the placeholder for the answer. So essentially here, what we want to do is, uh, we already identified three possible routes uh, or, for, or three possible paths uh, in the knowledge base that could mean the main, uh, main relationship between the topic entity and answer. And which one should we actually choose or uh, in other words, of, or because we're doing search, so maybe we should give it some kind of score to, um, you know, order them. So, in this case, uh, we essentially map it as a similarity problem. So, um, on one side, it's we, <coughs> it's the original ends. Uh, sorry, it, it's the original question, but we replace the entity with a generic symbol. So, it, essentially, what we do is that okay, let's make the question like a question pattern. Okay, and then because that's closer to the relationship we want to catch, capture. On the other side, we have uh, some candidate uh, relations. Uh, in this case, the cast actor. Um, so what we want to do here is really, given this pair of question pattern and also the relation, we want to know whether they, you know, they have high score, they have low score. Um, so what we do here is that the main idea is that we essentially just map it 
to uh, k dimension maker each side and then uh, compute the cosine score of these two uh, to, to rank them. Um, and so nowadays, if you use network, neural network, everything has to be deep. So uh, <laughs> this, this is done three, four years ago. Three, yeah, already. Um, so at the time we have a in-house uh, deep neural network model. It's doing this kind of stuff. It's neural network trying to compare um, two different um, text patterns. Um, so each one of the network here, if you zoom in, is um, like, like this framework. So it has, you chop words into character streams and then um, have a max pool in there to make sure the uh, dimensionality is the same uh, regardless the length of your input. Yes? Right. So, I mean, so what would you do if the main entry is not in the workout? Right. So, sorry, I didn't actually explain carefully. So, so in this uh, framework, they, uh, so this is not my work, or, uh, my colleague originally. Um, so, the interesting thing here is that one of uh, the, the issue of like wall embedding is that you have a large vocabulary size, right? So, um, to combat that problem, they, instead of using the original wall as a token, as the raw input, they chop word into a uh, character trigram. So uh, you can think of it like just three letters together. So, so that's the reason why they can actually reduce the uh, vocabulary size to 15K. So the 15K here is possible uh, character trigram, letter trigram you can have uh, instead of actually possible words you can have. So they were, so this stage is kind of like word hashing. So you imagine that you have words and instead of actually using the one half vector to use the index of the word in the vocabulary, uh, in the lexicon, you actually just map it uh, through some hash function. So this step is kind of like that. that. How often is mapping used or do I do like an unseen word across In this case, usually you won't have unseen word, but you have collision problem. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So because different words may actually end up uh, having the same number of back of uh, later track one. Um, right, so I kind of skipped that because there's a funny design in Freebase. So it's, uh, since you may ask that is, um, so there are two different types of nodes in Freebase. Uh, one is the real entity node. The other one is, they call it compound value type. Essentially it's the mechanism to uh, use binary relationship to um, represent multi-argument relationship. And so there's some kind of dummy node in, in, in the middle uh, but that no basically doesn't really have a real meaning. So in this case, we are, if there's, there's this kind of spatial stability no, we concatenate these two relationships together. Uh, but if it's a real no, we just actually use one relationship. Yeah. Um, okay, the final stage is actually to augment constraints. Um, so, so in this case, um, since we already have select one of the uh, kind of main relationship, uh, and then in that case, there are actually not that many options we can we need to consider. One is uh, probably the node uh, around the answer, which usually means the special properties that the uh, answer entity has. Or some nodes in the middle, and it's why here is really just the, uh, in three-based terminology, the compound value type node over there. Um, uh, so if you actually have a, a node associated to that, that mean, usually means uh, some of the properties of that particular event. Uh, so in this case, we actually just uh, uh, create some features and then um, have a different uh, classifier for, for that. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, so in, in this case, we actually just uh, um, use a pairwise ranking objective here. So think about it as uh, the input is each state, which is uh, the candidate parts or the uh, intermediate submitted parts. Um, and what we want to do is to have some kind of function to guide the search, telling the search procedure like, okay, here is the candidate parse S3, here's a candidate parse S4, and then the, you want to teach the um, search, to, and you want to tell the search procedure saying that, okay, actually S3 is better than S4. And why do we have this kind of label? Uh, here is that, you know, even though none of them is actually the correct parse in the end, 
but the first one is actually closer because the first one has the, the correct chain. What it means that, uh, yes, you won't directly get just the uh, actresses who play the role of Mac Griffin, but instead you actually get uh, all the actors of the family guy. So that actually will cover the real answer. So you have some overlap, overlap with the, the exact answer set. Uh, in contrast, the other one basically says the writer of that show. So you have no one, usually you have no one that covers the, the same um, actress or actors. So the first S3 is actually better than S4. Um, however, if we actually compare S3 and the two finals, uh, the, the exact, exactly correct parts, then of course you will prefer the exactly correct parts. So you can think that in this um, <coughs> part, we really want to learn a, a reward function like that to tell search, okay, on this step, which one is the preferred path to go next? Okay. Um, okay. So in this design, we'll just uh, look back a little bit on, okay, how does it address some of the key challenges I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, for language mismatch or the semantic matching problem, um, we use entity linking system. We actually use a very good entity linking system. Um, so it's kind of surprising to us at the time that nobody before us actually uh, did that. Um, and then the second one is that we use a deep neural network for relation matching. Uh, I think at the time it was also new. Um, and then for the, to deal with the large search space, we try, you can argue that it's try different kind of heuristic, try to reduce the uh, search space. Uh, for example, um, the length of the possible um, relations we consider is definitely, um, <coughs> is definitely helpful. And also um, by try to look at the knowledge base as early as possible, uh, that also helps us to actually shrink the, um, the number of candidates we consider. Um, so let me talk a little bit about experiment. So for, for whatever reason, and there was a data set that became very popular since uh, it appeared in uh, 2013. Um, so it's the web questions data set um, by Jonathan Barron and when he was a postdoc for uh, Procedian at Stanford. Um, so essentially the data set consists of uh, several pairs of questions and answers, and the answers are supposed to be uh, in free base and then provided by Turkers. Okay, so that's, uh, so, but they don't provide the um, submitted part. So it's really also in the weekly supervision setting that you only have the pairs of question and answers. Um, so here are the some of the examples of the um, questions and answers in, in the data set. Uh, I, you can see. Um, so the, the way they create this data set is a bit tricky. So essentially, from my understanding is that they generate some prefix and then they use Google search suggest API to do some query suggestion thing to suggest possible questions. So in some sense, uh, those questions may have some flavor that, okay, some of the component of the questions may be the, um, you know, the things that user may ask, uh, but it's really kind of distant and um, indirect way to get out those questions. Um, so about, Almost 4,000 questions are used for training and then a bit more than 2,000 questions for testing. Um, and the evaluation matrix is also a bit uh, different because ideally you should say that, okay, whether you get this question completely answered correctly or not. But uh, they use a little bit loose um, measure, which is uh, because the question may have multiple answers, so you can actually compute like recall precision. So in, in the end, uh, they just set up, okay, let's use uh, F1 score as the evaluation matrix. Uh, but roughly speaking, if I, it, you can rough, think of it as kind of a close um, alternative to just a accuracy. Uh, let's see, so here's some detail when we actually train different components for the things that we talk about. Uh, so for relation matching, we essentially just actually look at the knowledge base and look at the um, original question and the answers in the training data and try to uh, find possible path. So essentially what we do is that, uh, okay, we look at this um, type of entity and also look at uh, the potential uh, potential relations in the knowledge base. And then if the answer set actually gives us high enough F1 score, we basically say, okay, this is probably good enough. We're gonna use it as the um, pairs to train the relation matching model. And then for the uh, reward function training, uh, so 
we basically run a similar uh, heuristic, and then we kind of pre-create different um, pairs of this kind of query graph using training data so that uh, we have a, some kind of pairwise comparison. Uh, and then we use uh, that to train a essential logist, um, log linear model for that. Um, so we think our framework is actually relatively simpler um, and cleaner, um, but uh, it's also good that compared to the work before us, uh, it, it actually improved the performance uh, quite a lot from 40%-ish uh, to 2.5 at time. Um, and there's still a lot of work actually after we publish our paper. Uh, so the, it's not no longer a state of art, uh, but uh, as far as I know that all the firing work, uh, they still actually don't, haven't pushed the number uh, very high. And then a lot of, at least some of them actually we use our result and then add a little bit to increase that. Yes. That, that's a very good question. Uh, um, let me see. Uh, that's actually one of the focus of our show, follow up show paper. Uh, let me see if I have slides to talk about that. Uh, yeah, let me use this slide to explain it, and then you can uh, let me know if I answer the question. Um, so, usually, we, okay, so you, we, usually it's good that you, you know, improve a step R, and then the next step is that can we do better? Because to be honest, 52 is still not very high, right? So given a question, if it's roughly accuracy, you just get half of that correct. So of course, and then we want to the, uh, improve the system accuracy. That's the our original motivation for that project uh, we did uh, last year. But when we did some error analysis, we realized that um, the data set, the label part of the data set is actually not very good. So it's hard. You will, the first question you always ask is, okay, what's the seeding? And then is that, does it make sense? So, um, and then we found that roughly thir like one third of the questions, the answers are either incorrect or incomplete. So incomplete is actually more. So uh, for example, there's a question like, what sound did Bob Dylan write? And then the data set only has one answer, one song. So there's no way we can actually get that, uh, you know, guess uh, that answer correctly. So um, for that part, because of that, so um, this, in this project, which I'm not gonna have time to talk about, uh, essentially we de design a dialogue like labeling UI. So the, the thing is that um, we think that the original labeling process uh, makes it actually very hard to um, get the complete answers. So instead we think that, okay, maybe to label the first mimic process, if the tool is right, it's not as difficult as we thought or as people believe. So in that case, we actually spend some effort and then we design a dialogue of like labeling UI. Essentially the system will ask you, okay, what could be the topic entities? What could be the relations? And then you can go back and forth. And then in that case, we try to hide the knowledge graph or, or the formal things. Um, backstage and then so that the users will feel comfortable to do that and still get meaning. So we use that to actually relabel the whole data set and then uh, uh, because of that we, we have the full path so we can also provide it uh, updated answers. So uh, so I'm not gonna show that but if you use that data set and then our assistance performance is roughly uh, like 70% accuracy. And in that case I believe the in that case, because if you believe the answers are correct, then the upper bound should be 100. Okay. okay. Um, so another two things we wanted to do is that first is uh, mm -hmm. the original questions said, even though they claim that okay, they have some kind of conversational questions, but most of the questions are actually simple. Um, and so we want to address the complicated, highly conversational questions. Although you'll see that we actually take uh, we actually took an un unexpected turn there. And the second one is that, um, so when we ran the stake project, um, we actually kind of divide it into several stages and then try to build different models and then combine them together in the end. Um, it's, you can argue that it's probably not the most elegant way you can do things. Uh, so we really hope that you know, we can have an end-to-end joint learning framework for that. So these two things are, uh, kind of motivation when I when we start the next project, uh, which is called the dynamic semantic parser. Uh, this paper uh, with our intern Mohi Ayer. 
Um, okay. So here is the goal, or here's the example to answer highly compositional questions. <coughs> so in this case, instead of using a database, let's say that you, we are given a table like this, like a superhero um, properties or whatever. And then maybe the question is like, what is the power of superhero who is from the most common home world and appeared after 2010? So this is um, pretty complex already. Um, so people, well, I should say that researchers in academia love that because um, it's always like challenge research problem and it can, if you solve it, you can demonstrate that, oh yeah, we do understand language. Um, and so it has been advocated in semantic parsing um, field. Um, and this is from the data set um, called wiki table uh, questions, uh, also from Stanford, from Presley Young and this group. However, being in a corporation, being industry, we often will ask, okay, is this real? Is it, is it, uh, does, does the user really want to do uh, that? Or is it another way to ask this question is, uh, is this really a natural way to interact with uh, a question answering system? Okay. Um, so we cannot convince ourselves that this is really the most important question to solve. And instead, we think that a more natural interface, user interface, would be to break this com highly complicated question into a sequence-related questions um, from the user's perspective. I'm not saying that the computer is actually doing this decomposition for you. I'm thinking that if you're a user, you're, even if you have a very complicated intent, usually for you, it's already very hard to construct the long um, question. So it, it took me a while to actually construct that example for you. So um, a more natural uh, interaction would be like, oh, we probably will just use the system repeatedly and then to e explore different kind of information. So in this case, uh, you might start from like, oh, yes, the computer, like who are the first, uh, who are the superheroes on Earth? And then the computer may say, oh, check the data, I'll give you some. And then, then you can uh, ask some follow-up question like who appeared after 2010 and then was uh, the power and so on. So, so in this paper, uh, this paper actually consists of two parts. The first part is we essentially define the task and, and collect data for that. So this task is called the se sequential question answering. Um, um, essentially what we do is that, oh, we'll probably have another slide. Uh -huh. So we have released this data set and then essentially it's a sequence of questions and annotated answer uh, that are in the table. And in this particular case, we actually uh, gives you the coordinates uh, of the answer cells in that table. Okay. So the data set creation process, uh, let's just, uh, the first thing is that we actually re reuse the wiki table question data set that provided um, previously. So we use the same tables in that data set. Um, so we follow the same training testing split. And uh, then we, find the complicated questions in the original data set um, as our target to decompose, and then we call it intent. So, and then we use mTurk. So essentially we tell Turk saying that, okay, suppose we have these long complicated questions uh, you want the answer to, and then, but instead of actually just asking the whole question, uh, please try to kind of separate it into a sequence of um, interrelated questions. And then we provide the UI so that the, not only the turkeys will actually provide a sequence of questions, and then for each question, they will actually select the sales as the answers to the question. Okay. So the, so the UI answers are simple questions? The simple questions, yes. Because we, we know the, or the, the answers to the uh, original questions, their intent. So we also ask them, okay, the final question, the answer should be the same as the original question. Yeah. Some of the sequential questions have co-reference, right? One is like one. That's right. That's right. So so because in the context is that assuming that the system will get not just one question independently, you'll get also a sequence of questions, okay. right? So that's uh, the setting of the test. Yeah. Um, so here, are, here is a, an example. So original intent would be this question, and then probably you can have a sequence of three questions that essentially in the end get the answer to the original questions. Um, and here are some data statistics like we essentially start from about 2,000 long questions and then um, effectively there will be um, <clears throat> about two, the equal number of the sequence, but we have three annotators for uh, each intent. 
and so we have uh, <coughs> in the end about 6,000 question sequences and each one has roughly three questions. So uh, we have 17,500 questions in, in the end. Okay. So the second part is, okay, now given this, uh, yes. question. Um, so you're asking like whether the questions are meaningful or the, and also the answers to those questions they provide are correct or not. Right. Um, I, let me see. So because this part is done by Mohi, so let me try to think about that. Um, I think he did some check and to verify of course from him and to make sure that okay they are actually reasonable. I, I won't be I won't say that every question is perfectly labeled, but most, most of them are actually uh, reasonable. And another thing is uh, in the UI design, we try to um, make it simple so that um, the answers will be, um, for example, a lot of time is the question is really asking about whole column. So the UI design will actually say, okay, they can actually collect the whole column. So you. Because sometimes it's a genuine mistake that the, you know you click on the sales, but you you actually miss one of them. So in the UI design, we try to avoid these kind of errors as much as possible. Um, yeah, I guess the the answer to your original question really is, um, I think Mohi did some kind of error, um, kind of quality verification test by sampling some of the questions and then check the answers. Yes. How often do you think it's the case that the sequence of questions? Um, the order, um, so you can ask your right. Right. So I don't know particularly know about order, but uh, uh, we did some check. For example, um, there's some easy, relatively easy thing we can check. Like <laughs> like before the before really run the the full enter class, we did some pilot, and then. One thing we found that some in the initial pilot is that um, some Turkers, either because they are lazy or they, they don't really understand the full task, uh, for the final question of the sequence, they actually just copy the original question to that. Because uh, that will guarantee that you'll get the same answer, but that's not exactly what we want. So we did some, some checking on that. Um, about the older sequence, I, I, th I think that's relatively rare because uh, in the guideline, we really want them to do is that the first question is probably the broader question. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it actually consists of just the words of the beginning, the prefix of the original question. Because, uh, yeah, yeah. But it's kind of hard to control that because we try out some other ideas. Uh, like, does, does that map to some like column and row selection? So it makes it simple, but we think that's very hard to define operationally. So in, in the end, we just provide examples like oh, this is what we mean by simple questions. Yes? In this case, it, uh, it looks like the question is similar in three and each for opinion. Mm-hmm, 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 yeah. So, so it's not like there's a to like straight total order, so the partial order will be fine. So even though it's a sequential questions, uh, sequence of questions, um, it, it's not always the case that to answer three, you really have to answer one and two, and to answer two, you already have one. Sometimes it's just the second question, but it can still be treated as independent question, um, um, you know, and you can answer that, yeah. Okay, um, I have about 14 minutes left. Um, right, so in this work, we have uh, another semantic parser. Um, so in this case, it's a bit, a bit different because the data source is not a large base, but tables instead. Um, but we treat tables as independent single table database. Um, now the goal is that give it a question, get a query, and then so you can run on the table. Um, the ideal recipe I have for the solution would be uh, like first we have to still define the formal query uh, semantic parse language used here. And then the second one is um, following the kind of rational design form of stake, we can still try to formulate it as a search problem. So you have to define the state action and the extra instruction. Uh, for runtime, we just actually do the search and then find the best end state, which actually represent um, the semantic parts. Um, and then we have a learning method called reward guided structured output learning in this framework. 
So let me give you uh, more detail on those things. Um, the formal language part. Because um, it's, it's table, so um, essentially what we do here is just, OK, let's uh, use uh, something like similar to SQL, because it's easy to understand and actually fits uh, um, the table scenario um, <coughs> nicely. Um, and then it's actually a very restricted SQL-like thing, because right, right now we only handle like select column and then add uh, some conjunctions of conditions. It doesn't really, this simple language doesn't cover all the questions, but cover already uh, most of the questions. And in terms of states and actions, um, so a state really means that a uh, candidate or partial semantic parts we are actually exploring in when we uh, try to find the, the correct parts. And the action will be just like stack, we just add some primitive statement to uh, um, existing partial semantic parts or, or the candidate. So here is the example, like uh, if this is a question, and then these five steps are kind of five different actions we break um, the parts into. So this actually, I think the, trend, um, <coughs> the mapping is kind of uh, straightforward. So the first one is select the character column, and then the second one is you have to condition on this homework col column, and the value should be equal to earth, and, and, and so on. Uh, of course, you know, in this case, you can also divide, uh, design some um, function to actually restrict the possible search space by saying that, oh, if you're, for example, if you already uh, have a select column op operation, and then uh, if you assume that you can only have one select column, then, then uh, in the follow-up actions, you will not allow that the same um, action will, be, uh, will appear again. Okay, now, I, then how about the, the search part? So search part is kind of similar. So here, suppose in the end we have these three actions that represent the original uh, questions. So again, we'll start from nothing, which is S0 here. And then the first step, is, first action is that I'm gonna uh, do this select character. And then um, the next one will be a condition on homeworld. And the final one is the value equal to Earth. Um, because it's search, so I won't be that lucky to get the one first time. So it's really you should consider it as a like a Bing search thing. You actually explore as many uh, possible actions, states, combinations as possible. So uh, a state is essentially a sequence of actions in this case. Because um, if you are in S3, essentially it's just the combination of all the actions from S0 that leads to your current state. Um, and if you have search, then you have to have some function to tell you like how good is uh, your current state is. So that's the very function here. Um, so we just define recursively, but really it's just like um, you have a pi function, which is that given this current state and given uh, the, the next action I'm gonna take, how good that is. So the very function is simply just the uh, part function, the pi function of all the actions you have taken from S0 to here. Okay, and then the initial value function is zero. So really, to decide how good your search is, it actually de depends just on that pi function. Okay, so our design is that we will use a, a neural network model for that function, um, and the actions of the same type, like select column, will share the same uh, neural network module. Uh, <coughs> so here is some example like that. So Suppose this is one of the path we, um, we found. And then in the first action, we'll have a module to tell you, okay, how good that is. And then we have another module to tell you how good it is for the second action and so on. So each one of them actually takes the question and table as the input, and then we'll output the, uh, the pi function value in the end. And because I mentioned that the value function of the state is really just the sum of all these, so you can just add them together. In the end. Okay, um, so this idea is actually similar to um, a novel paper last year uh, called about they, they call it a dynamic module or neural module network. Uh, yeah. So, but the difference is that in the, their work they actually predefine the structure, which is actually the, the difficult part. They they kind of ignore that. Um, and here in our work is that we actually construct. We actually kind of groove those modules together as we search, because each action actually will be associated with a certain type of uh, neural network module. And each module actually reflects the semantics of that action. 
So uh, let me just use a very s this select column as example. So if you want to decide, okay, whether the question actually talk about the character column in the table, which in this case, you, whether you want to go uh, to take this select, um, select character action, what you really want is actually, okay, um, does my question actually consist of the, um, something that is actually, that can be mapped to the column character. So right now, we, we don't have very smart design to really tackle the problem. So instead, we are trying to uh, essentially create different kind of similarity comparison function uh, and then um, use the neural network to combine them. And then that model and data decide which the base um, combination. So in this case, uh, this is one of the uh, similar score, as you can see here, is that for the question, we run a bio LSTM and then create a word embedding to capture that question and then as one of the input. And the, um, the color name character will be also um, captured by a one embedding. And then those two things will do um, in the product as the similarity score and as one of the uh, similarity score. And we have other similarity scores, and in the end, we just combine them as a neural network uh, in this case. So this loosely covers what we want to do here, essentially trying to see if the color name character can be mapped to somewhere in the question. Yes. The output in the end will represent how good is um, this action, right? So, uh, and the nice thing about New York is now you can actually chain everything together in this case. Um, so, remember that. Um, so we have the. Uh, okay, so. So let me let me talk about the uh, reward, this learning method a little bit. So in this setting, we are using the indirect supervisions, which means that we don't have the parts, but we have the pairs of question and answers. So the higher level idea of this algorithm is actually pretty simple. Uh, so think about it as like similar to perceptron. So the first step is that we'll find the reference semantic parts uh, that, it, that gives you the, the goal answers. Okay. And then the second step is that we'll find the predict semantic parts based on the current model. And then we can derive the loss by comparing these two. And then, because everything in the end is chained together, so you can back prop and, um, all the way and then uh, to update the parameter using stochastic gradient descent. Okay. This is actually a very oversimplified version. So let me try to dive in a little bit to give you a little bit more detail. So for, to find the reference parts, to that evaluates to the uh, goal answers is like this. So uh, you can think of that you're still doing search, but now you don't have the model score. You only have the true answer, the goal answers. Um, so what, what's your goal? Your goal is actually to find that, oh, uh, A here is the answers generated by evaluating your uh, candidate pass. If you pass as you give you the correct answer, even though in this case it may not be real, the, the real correct Parts, but we assume that if the parts gives you the, the, the exact same answer, then we assume that that's the, our parts we want to find. So in that case, it's really just an indicate, indicate function whether the answer is the same as the goal answer. So uh, for, for example, that in this case, you hope that, okay, somehow we magically hit this node because this node actually gives us the answer that is the same as the uh, label answer. However, in reality, that's very difficult because if you don't have any hint in the beginning of search, essentially what you have to do is exhaustive search, right? Because everything other than S3 is incorrect. So in the, in the beginning, all the rewards are zero, so there's, you essentially have to search everything. So in this case, we can kind of develop a heuristic um, because we know that um, essentially we define a uh, user jacquard coefficient. So here's the thing. So if you have a state S and then A, uh, A of S means that um, the answers you can derive from this semantic parts. Now let's think about this. So if you're actually choosing this path, select character. So you're just here, you haven't reached this point yet. This will give you some, sorry, this will give you some answer that covers the final answer because in the all after things, uh, you know, all the things afterward are actually just restricting the answer set. So because of our design, so this will give you a non-zero Jaka score over here because it has some overlap with the goal answer. In comparison, if you actually go through this route, 
we choose a different column, and then there's no answer that actually overlaps with the uh, go answer. So in this case, you'll get zero jackass score. So you can stop here, you won't actually explore uh, that real. So this is a simple heuristic that we, get, we can use to help us to have higher chance to reach this goal. But that doesn't mean that we always find the, the perfect uh, one. So maybe you, you know, after some, um, you know, in our Bing, it, it should, essentially we just have some high Jaka score, but it's still not one. But anyway, so we will actually just use the highest we can find as the reference in this case. Now, to find the predicted semantic, par uh, predicted semantic parts, um, this is actually direct from um, uh, Stroger SVM's uh, um, formulation. But let me try to explain it uh, here. Um, so the ideal case is that if you want to compare the um, every candidate semantic parse with the goal, uh, with the best semantic parse, the reference semantic parse, then the idea we uh, the thing we want to have is that the value function, the value function of the um, the correct parse, should be higher than any other parse. Okay, and not only that, it, so you can say that oh, originally we just want to have larger than zero, meaning that this one is better than any other one. Um, but there's a notion of margin in SVM, so you can just put this, so this essentially is that we want it to, to not just bigger, we want the value to be high enough. So you can think of the right hand side as margin, and the S star is the reference parse. So uh, essentially we want to, uh, every state actually satisfy this constraint. But in practice, you know, if everyone satisfies that constraint, basically it means that your learning is done. So um, in this update rule, essentially what we do is, that, uh, so we will actually use the current model and then we try to find the most violent um, submitted parts. In that case is that uh, you look at each, ideally you look at each candidate, each state, and then you find the one that is the worst case, which means that this part minus that part you use that as, as the degree of variation. So that's essentially the, the loss is really just the right-hand side minus uh, that left-hand left side here. And you find that one and then immediately, okay, that's our ta target to update. So you can actually derive loss of, of that. Um, and then, then you can just uh, use gradient descent to update the, the model. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, my other question, so, so you're assuming that your actual uh, and are basically independent, right? So independent of the state. Right? So you select, for example, the condition and this, right? So it's you don't really really you have to first select it, then condition yeah. and then not yeah. right, right. Yeah. Do you do you incorporate that sort of as a hard constraint? We incorporate that hard constraint. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I say the A C T function used. So given a state, so there are um, small set, uh, uh, there are, there's a subset of actions that you can choose. So we use that to kind of constrain our search okay. space. So yeah. It's kind of hard built into the model. It's hard built it, but right. uh, you can also argue that it's, it's good to have, but it's actually not necessary because without that, you just actually have a larger search space. So in principle, it's okay, but in practice, you always want to actually use whatever you can, information you can have and domain knowledge. Yeah. Another thing is you can ask is that you can say that, oh, maybe I don't care about select column first, where I just want to decide condition first. In that case, you even can swap order. But here, we, I kind of follow the rationale behind the design of stake. So I just, I just wanted to switch. Right. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can you use uh, constraint? How problematic was it? It could, but it it depends on the data. Uh, so, for example, one nasty case is that if the question is asking about some number, and if your table actually has a lot of number, and a lot of numbers are actually the same, then this assumption probably will be violated heavily. So that's the um, yeah, that's the downside of this kind of dis dis distribution. I'm sorry. In practice, as I said, it, it's data dependent. So in our case, it's probably not that bad. Yeah. Okay, so it's already done. So uh, let me just quickly go through that. So we, 
So, so far I only talked about one question, but remember that the test is actually sequential questions. And so we actually modify the parts to deal with, uh, like if the question is actually not the first question. So we can say that uh, maybe in that case, the answer has to depend on the previous answer. So we modify the parts a little bit on that. Uh, there are two previous assistant built on uh, to solve wiki table questions and which are served as our face time. Um, so here are some numbers. Um, the overall accuracy we got is about 44.7 uh, and the sequence, the whole sequence accuracy is only 12.8 now, uh, but it, it's understandable, right? So you have to get every question in that sequence correct to count it as a correct predict sequence. And uh, to break down a little bit, yes? So is that sequence accuracy the same as accuracy on those questions in the original data set? In the original data set. Uh, no, no, no. Right. I think one of the reviewers asked the same question. <laughs> uh, uh, I think the original one actually got higher, yeah. But it's hard to compare these two cases, right? Yeah. So I guess the question is, the intent that you made yeah. these sequences from right. was the original question. Is this right? Yes. So then shouldn't full sequence accuracy be the same as accuracy on the question? No, because we don't use the same system, and then we are not actually given the same information, right? Okay. Right. So it's a sequence thing. And then the, the thing is that if you actually made the first question answer incorrectly, and then the error will propagate. And that, that's kind of things here. So if you break down like the, here, we show like top three questions. You get first one usually, you know, not bad. Uh, that's actually also simpler here. But then, uh, you know, the, the performance actually degrades um, very quickly. Okay, uh, I won't I'll skip the Cherry Neyman thing. <laughs> um, some reflection. So. Uh, Nice thing about this to me is that, okay, we, we have an end-to-end -end learning system, so that's kind of improvement compared to uh, previous work. Um, and then the thing I want to do is actually conversation or QA, so the system actually can interact with you to fulfill your information on need. Uh, I th this is not quite conversational yet, but I think this is uh, a nice first step toward that direction. Um, the next steps, uh, one challenge here is that because everything is so dynamic, so m it makes mini batch very difficult. So to train this system, uh, the original code implementation is actually not fast enough for us to do experiment, experiments quickly. Uh, I think I have some idea of improving that. I'm in the middle of actually implementing a, a new, um, you know, uh, a new prototype. Uh, and then semantic parsing is still an issue. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, um, semantic batching is an issue. Um, because um, if you actually just learn the mapping from the data question and the table, a lot of uh, kind of paraphrase sentences, you, you will not be able to actually learn that efficiently or, uh, from just the data you use. Okay, so uh, the summary of uh, the talk. Uh, so I, I quickly introduced um, like a couple of our projects uh, in the uh, recent years. Um, and then um, for the technical challenge that I mentioned in the beginning, um, I, these are kind of our strategies so far to, to deal with those. Uh, Submit matching, we, we try to use continuous implementation and new F models uh, for large search space. Uh, we use search, state action search to help that and also with some heuristic to cut the search space. Uh, I didn't have the chance to talk about the uh, label data thing, but I mentioned that we actually designed some interesting UI for that. Uh, conversation, conversationality, we didn't really handle that directly. We actually just say that that's probably not natural, so we try to, to address it in a, in a different way. Um, yeah. Um, so I have some, I think, three, three slides more for some other like, thinking about the future work. Um, so I started doing question answering about like four or five years ago. Uh, at the time, search engines are, were still more like a temporal links. Um, so I really like the, the a short article Owen wrote on, on Natural about like we should actually move from uh, search engine to QA engine. And then if you look at the search engines nowadays, it's actually following that trend pretty nicely. Uh, I don't think they, they, they do that because of Owen's paper, but it's kind of everyone probably was thinking about that direction at the time. Um, so question, and, and then for that, and then we should actually ask critical question, okay, 
is, for example, is knowledge base really the right source for answer questions? Uh, so there are some positives, like um, to, for example, to search. Um, usually we can handle the head, head query very well, or head question very well, but the problem is usually on the tail. But for knowledge base, if you got the parse correct, you don't really care about whether the entity is its tail or head, because you actually run the same query, structure query at um, um, the same time, um, every time. Right. Um, and the nice thing about semi-carousing to me is that it tries to really tries to understand the question that you have a local grounding. You, you know the relationship and you, you know the entity. So potentially it's easier to debug or easier to communicate like to user. Maybe um, you know, your system is actually uh, not sure about like maybe the entity uh, linking is ambiguous. But there's also a down, downside in terms of question answering. Like knowledge base probably is not good to answer um, some question like, where to watch TV online for free in Canada. So I just can't imagine that kind of things will be defined in knowledge base. Um, and another thing is that knowledge base is usually not only incomplete, but it's uh, not up to date. Um, who is FBI director, right? So I, I don't, that depends on how diligent the people behind knowledge base is to you know, quickly add or update uh, the knowledge base. Uh, so those kind of things, actually Newswire articles probably will be a better source because it's faster. Uh, so to really, Solve that. I mean, to make search engine a QA engine, we probably need a variety of different information sources. So that's why uh, I did some work not only on the semantic parsing role using knowledge base, but also on some like more like reading comprehension type of uh, QA work. Uh, but semantic parsing to me, uh, after I've done some work, I, I think it's actually not just for question answering, because I think it's a critical component for natural language interface. So if you think about that, it really is the bridge between human language and structured data. Um, so the structured data is actually just not database or whatever, uh, but it actually, you can think of that every complicated software assistance is some kind of structure, right? So it, for us, if you want to actually let users to know how to use so many nice features in Excel or Word, uh, probably you, it's easier to use the natural language as an interface and then you, know, you have a component translate that thing uh, to the things that uh, the system is using. And also the app thing is that so many app and different app has different UI. So having natural language as the interface is kind of the more ultimate universal uh, interface. And semantic parsing I think is uh, in important, especially in this um, scenario. Um, but the key to success why I think is really still final, you probably still need to find some way to learn from the user. So interactive learning and also collect data from the user will be important. Uh, finally, my long-term aspiration is, people call it, it's really natural language understanding. Um, natural language processing is actually not that meaningful to me because processing is kind of ambiguous to me. So, um, and then I was hoping that, you know, in the end we can build a conversational QA engine. Um, and uh, it actually leveraged two important components like machine reading, you can extract knowledge from text. Uh, I think AI2 has done a very good job here during the past three years. Uh, but another thing is conversational AI, which is a hot topic nowadays. Um, but I think uh, you know, using this as interface and using machine reading as to together uh, to understand text would be critical. Um, and from, there are two obvious trends for me. Uh, one is that advanced machine learning techniques are especially deep learning. It, you can you can deny that. Um, it's kind of funny thing that when you look at the like ACO in 2014, with world embedding was a hot topic, and then the next year uh, everyone is doing LSTM, and then last year I think a lot of people are doing reinforcement learning. Uh, and I haven't checked this year. Maybe dialogue system and also a lot of different neural network module uh, uh, framework will be actually dominating the conference. Uh, but to be fair, deep learning or any kind of this deep machine learning, uh, advanced deep um, machine learning techniques, they're still pretty difficult to use. Um, so how to um, make things easy for people to actually, you know, um, be able to use that, not just the infrastructure, but the high level component, I think will be the key to, um, to enable breakthrough in the following years. Um, I, I'm a believer of a like, data-driven approach. Um, so we, the low, the um, availability of big data actually is getting better and better. And then one of the reasons is the cross-sourcing cost. Uh, but I think that's, that can help us to some extent in the end um, 
to really learn from user probably will be even more crucial in that thing. Um, all right, thanks. I think that's, the, that's that. Thank you.